Okay, so good evening, everyone. Thank you for, for joining us for tonight's webinar. Um, tonight's session is called Adapting Sessions uh, for Your Players. And same rules as normal for those that have been around and been here before. If you can, if I can ask that everyone has their microphones muted so we don't get any feedback, um, one person talking at a time. And obviously our session will be recorded and added to the Hills Football YouTube channel uh, tomorrow. Feel free throughout the uh, entire session to ask questions, take photos, make as many notes as you possibly want, um, take as much away from this as you possibly can. Uh, we will have the chat function sort of managed throughout. So if, we're, if someone's talking and going too fast, feel free just to type a question in there and we'll backtrack. Um, but we will have moments where we'll stop sort of in between um, certain parts of the conversation and encourage any questions and uh, any discussion point from there. We, we definitely don't want this to just become uh, us talking to you. Uh, we would love as much uh, group discussion and uh, feedback from you guys because um, it's a great opportunity for, for us to learn uh, and hear how things work and, and stuff on the ground as well. So we'd love it to be a, a bit of two-way. Quick introduction. Um, most of you probably um, recognize me, know me, or fed up with me, uh, possibly as well. My name is Dan Shepherd. I'm the technical director for Hills Football Association. Currently hold an A license, C license instructor, um, and assessor, as well as a community certificate presenter. And that's probably where most of you have seen me down on the grass delivering some courses. Uh, many, many years ago, I also uh, got a Bachelor of Honours degree in Sports Studies um, and my, my coaching experience has pretty much covered all elements of the game. Um, there isn't many parts that I haven't had some sort of uh, um, touch point with in relation to, to football. Um, so there's always something that I can come up with and find out uh, a little bit more along there. But enough about me. Um, tonight, I'm joined by Gareth Long and Louise, Dr. Louise, um, here both from ACPE, uh, and I think it's going to be fantastic to hear their insights. Um, both come from very different coaching backgrounds and will be able to provide us a very different perspective um, of not only their experiences and their um, direction that they, they would possibly take football, but also their coach education and background and what they've learned along the way. So, Gareth is a uh, a B licensed coach that has worked as a coach educator in England uh, as well as Australia and is currently the Inner West Hawks under 13 Sporting's Youth Development Lead as well as the under 13 coach for Glebe Wanderers. Uh, Luis is a um, lecturer in sports coaching for ACPE and uh, you can say a little bit more about where he's been, but he's got uh, a good resume with. Japan, Brazil, uh, New Zealand, and a number of other different countries uh, along, along the way there, and uh, has done his PhD in skill acquisition, um, looking actually at Brazilian football players. Um, Gareth and Louise, great to have you on board um, and joining us tonight to share some knowledge and uh, opinions. Uh, if you watch, just want to um, sort of say a couple of words about yourself and uh, what you're looking forward to. I'll look down. It's, it's firstly, thank you for the invitation. Um, this has come about um, maybe a little bit that we've known each other for a few years, but also through the relationship that ACP has with, with Hills Football now, which is this, this is an exciting part of that, the, the fact that um, we all share a passion for coach education. So um, fantastic to be here and thank you for the invitation. Looking forward to, to sharing some thoughts and, and um, as you said, listening to other people's um, thoughts. So thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much for both of you to include me in this uh, opportunity. Actually, yeah, I've been around um, involved with football at all levels as well, from grassroots to professional football. And I'm so excited to be in Australia now. This is been here for three months, uh, working with Gareth. And um, one of the key aspects for me and excitement to come over I like the research aspect of the sports and football and teaching, but also the idea of ACP have the opportunity to be very applied 
and to, to be able to participate in, in, in webinars or uh, like this one, it, it's, a, it's a, a bonus for me. So thank you very much. Pleasure to have both of you. So for everyone else, um, very short agenda for us. Uh, so hopefully there's gonna be plenty of discussion points and people are gonna come with some questions and some input, otherwise we'll be done in a very short time. But essentially uh, everyone that's joined on tonight would have been sent a session plan and a short and a bit of video around the context of what we're looking at tonight in terms of our session. Uh, and we're gonna look at some of the background and rationale around that. Um, then delivering that in practice and then possibly some alternatives. And we're going to sort of take that in different directions as we go from there. Okay, I don't think we need to go through the whole thing. I think we get the, the idea and most of you would have seen this video sent through an email earlier on. But for those of you that haven't worked it out, tonight's session and tonight's discussion is really looking at the Rondo. Um, world famous sort of training activity that I'm sure uh, everyone has probably either seen or participated in or potentially delivered at some stage um, in their playing or coaching or parent sort of capacity um, and we're sort of taking that now and looking at some some different ways of thinking about it and where to go and what that could possibly do um, for your team and how you might find it valuable or um, beneficial towards your players so that's the context that's where we're starting at and um, we see the professionals do it all the time Barcelona probably and Pep probably the ones that made it world famous but it's been around for, for much longer than there. Um, so I'm going to stop my share and we're going to go straight into Luis with, um, with your discussion. Excellent. What I'm going to do, I just finished um, rendering my, I uh, recorded a five minutes video, animated video. So we'll see if we can find it here. Um, The screen. Let me know if you can hear. Can you see it? We can see it. Luis, should, should we be hearing it? Yes, you can't hear. I can't. Can you, Dan? No, I can't hear anything. Yeah, no, there's no audio. Um, so when I share... Just when you share, there's sometimes a click uh, to share your computer sound as well. As well Luis. Yeah. Share sound, yeah. Let's see if it does. No sound on that one. Derived from home, oh, yeah. the term rondo became fashionable in Italian opera in the 18th century to express a piece of music in which a refrain is repeated between episodes. That's it. It goes round and round, or goes in a circle. In the context of football, Rondo is a training exercise design comprising a small circle of players practicing ball possession. 
It is also known as pig in the middle, bull retention, or being little them in Brazil. Anecdotally, Rondo was developed as a football training tool by the Spanish coach Loriano Ruiz in the late 50s. As the coach of Barcelona in 1976, his Rondo form of training made a last effect on a special player of that Barca team, Johan Cruyff. As a coach, Cruyff further implemented the notion of Rondo, which became one of the foundations of the playing philosophy of the Catalan team. Rondo was further advanced by another Catalan icon and protege of Cruyff, Pepe Guardiola, who created a dynasty between 2008 and 2012 as the head coach of the Barca team. From there onwards, the notion of Rondo was popularized around the world of football in many different nations. The basic form of Rondo exercises the typical 3v1 or 4v2. However, there are many other Rondo formats which you can find online or in books, such as this one here. Personally, as a coach and as a sports scientist, I'm interested in the theoretical and empirical evidence that can support my decisions on when and how to use Rondo as a training tool for players' learning and enhancement of performance. This includes 1 the manipulation of task and environment constraints according to the stage of learning of the players. That's it. Constraints-led approach, stage of learning theories. Two, providing a learning environment which can stimulate, in an implicit way, players' opportunity for actions. That's it. Representative learning design and affordance theories. 3. Providing a learning environment where players can be stimulated, once again in an implicit way, the ability to effectively link their technique with the ability to read the game in order to make appropriate decisions. That's it, perception action coupling theory. Also, as a coach and sports scientist, I'm interested to know how social culture factors influence the way that football players learn and improve their skills. On a parallel but relevant note, in the context of Brazilian football, it's interesting to see how social culture factors such as samba, capoeira, malandragem, that's it, artful, cunning, street marks, or pelada, pick-up games, and even poverty have influenced the development of perception motor skills of Brazilian footballers. Back to the context of Rondo, in Brazil we have historically been playing different forms of Rondo but the Portuguese term that best represents Rondo is bobinho, that's it, a little dumb, referring to the player in the middle chasing the ball. Bobinho is usually played in informal situations, example, before the start of the training sessions, or played informally by children on the streets or in parks. However, the key aspect of bobinho is the fact that Unlike Rondo, Bobinho is played in a ludic way. This allows players to have fun and social interaction, in particular by expressing their malandragem, artful, and ginga, but sway, skills to deceive the Bobinho. I believe that this ludic form of playing Rondo may lead to the development of other important aspects of football that is creativity and improvisation. What do you think? I'm looking forward to further discuss this issue and the overall aspect of Rondo with you. Thank you. Right, this is just a very brief synopsis what I would like to some of the key points for me is obviously as a sports scientist I'm interested in the theoretical and empirical evidences about Rondo or any forms of training but also how the culture social culture aspect of the society influence the way that they play football and vice versa and how the way the football influences society for example I know that in England it's a massive sports and 
and so is in Brazil and Turkey and, and even in Australia, even though in Australia probably is not the main sport. So um, it's uh, two ways of seeing it, but um, uh, part of my research is about that. It's to see how it, more specifically football and the skill acquisition, motor learning, how the, the, the social cultural aspect influence the way that uh, Brazilian um, learning and develop their skills. And, but also um, I would like to expand that. And this is one of the reasons why I'm here in Australia. I think it's a very rich culture as well. And potentially can be very big and rich in terms of football. Um, it's up to you how we're going to deal with these guys, but um, I think Gareth is going to touch uh, the, the next step, and I don't know if you want to discuss it now or ask questions, or we leave the questions to the end. Can I ask a question, Dan, if that's all right? Can I ask Louise a question? Yeah, go for it. Uh, Louise, it, it doesn't surprise me that um, it's part of the Brazilian culture and very informal and play and arrival. Has it ever, or has it recently, had a had a place in the in I suppose the more formal part of the the coaching session and the coaching structure? Rondo. Yes, Rondo. Yeah, it has. That's very interesting. I've been talking to a friend of mine and some of the coaches, professional coaches in Brazil, and um, because I'm out of Brazil for more than thirty years, and. Um, the last time I was there, I was doing a little coaching, but it was 2007, 2011. Uh, but my friends, they said, yeah, um, we used to do a lot of bobinhos, but now after Guardiola, they actually implement this notion of rondo in the training sessions, which is a little bit different than the bobinho. It's more intense. It's, it's, um, it's uh, different. Uh, there's a lot of variations and it's not just fun. It's the aspect of improving technique and skills, but also fitness. They use a lot of that to do a little bit of fitness out of that as well. Yeah, and there's a lot of variations, of course, and trying to be a little more applied in the sense, more representative to the game, not just the preview one. When it when it comes to Rondo, they have the, the some of the quotes put the transition inside of it as well to be a little more direct and more objective increase the objectivity of the game. My, um, my question to, to actually to the group, um, the viewing coaches here is, uh, how many of you are, are sort of used to using a rondo or have, um, I guess, played it as a player or been a coach and delivered it, whether uh, everyone could potentially just raise their hand or click on the emotions button if you don't want to show your camera and let us know or or just shout out. Yep, Robert has. Yep, Carlos, Ollie. Yep, yeah, it's pretty much everyone's coming in. So everyone's uh, pretty familiar with it, Gareth. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask a Can I ask a question to the group, Dan? Does yeah. any uh, Luis outlined a lot of the positivity, the positives of it, the creativity, the improvisation? Does anybody have any, let's go to the other side, does anybody have any issues or, or problems with it? Because I've certainly heard of some and I, I've certainly tried to address those in, in, in mine, in my um, part. Does anyone have any, or heard any yeah. negative things? Someone? Uh, yeah, Gareth Carlos here. Um, hey, Carlos. I, yeah, yeah, it's a great question. And um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm in the, um, uh, I guess the, the younger youth space too, so, when you say a rondo to those guys, it's, it's uh, to those kids, it's two in the middle and, 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 and maybe it's five or six on the outside. But I guess the, my question comes from is how do we, how do you make it different for them? Cause obviously if you're doing it, you know, twice a week or um, if you're doing it numerous times, uh, how do we make it different? How do we make it more appealing for them to keep doing it as well? Cause obviously uh, it's really in the beholder of who's doing it. Yeah, that's brilliant. And hopefully that probably leads quite nicely into hmm. mine, Dan. It's like I set, <laughs> set up. Um, so I, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll do my um, uh, short presentation. And then um, if you think that hasn't answered that, and I, 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 um, I think my presentation will be clear that it, I'm not 
um, trying to be comprehensive about this at all, but just to give some, give some um, context to, um, to, to my situation. I and mean, hopefully it answers a little bit of that. Um, right. Give me the thumbs up, Dan, if you can see it. Okay. All good, Dan, yeah? I missed your thumbs up, is it there? Yeah, go on, lovely. All right, so um, um, again, thank you for, for being here. Um, I love the title of this, and, and, and in, in many ways, we might get distracted by just talking about rondos. For, for me, this was about how to adapt sessions, and we, we've chosen Rondo to do that because, look, we're all, we're all searching for um, ideas. Some of us are, uh, uh, you know, well-planned and, and maybe have a months ahead. Some of us are thinking about it as we're driving to our, our um, coaching sessions, I'm, I'm sure. Um, so we're all um, borrowing, stealing stuff. But I think the key is that we don't just uh, take stuff and, and use it because, whoever has designed that stuff on the internet or in that book hasn't got our players in mind. So hopefully an outcome for today is, is that we can take those ideas, but adapt it for our players. So look, I, I thought it was worthwhile sharing a little bit about what I think, um, how I like to coach. I'm certainly not saying that I do this every session um, and I often have to go to this to remind myself of what I believe uh, coaching should be for the players that I work with. And I put my DNA because a lot of this isn't original and it's not unique to me and I've, I've stolen it and been heavily influenced by the, the, the England um, DNA from my time working with the FA. But in terms of, I asked myself this question, in terms of Rondos, does it fit into what I believe um, as a coach? And certainly there's some, there's some ticks straight away. Okay. You know, you just see from that um, uh, clip, that the video that Dan shared, you can see that, um, you know, it, it creates a positive, enthusiastic environment. Although I totally take the point that maybe if it's done again and again and again, maybe that isn't always like that. Um, certainly there is some support for players, individual technical abilities. Okay. That sort of, um, um, receiving passing under under pressure um, is certainly evident in rondos i think um, it's active um, you know we, we should get a quite a lot of ball rolling time there's not a lot of the coach talking so that's probably good and as as louise said a lot of the um, benefit of it maybe encourages that creativity um, um, that, that, that we would like players to have. So that was my first thing when, when Dan set us this challenge of how we're going to adapt this for the players. I thought, well, you know, is it something that I would use? And probably the answer is yes. There are lots of boxes unticked. And what, I'm, what my challenge was, was, okay, well, well do they have to be unticked? Or, or can we, 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 we tick them? And actually, if, I, if I'm trying to tick these boxes, am I taken away from the, um, the purpose of a rondo? The second context that I want to talk about are, is my team and um, the team that I'm that I'm going to base this on is my under 13 grassroots team, Glebe Wanderers, who I've had um, since I came to Australia. So since under sevens, I've had most of these um, players. So the I suppose the question that I have to ask is, OK, well, would the Rondo support these players needs? My context is. I've got 15 players in my squad. That means, you know, I could have anything from 10 to 15 turn up to training. Uh, I have half a field. I don't even think I'm supposed to have half a field. I think I encroach on, on other, um, I get there early and encroach on other teams. Um, 75 minutes, officially it's an hour, but again, I try and extend it as long as possible until I see that the parents are really wanting to take their, their kids home. And we have one outdoor session. We also have an indoor session, but that pretty much is, is, is I, you know, I, I try not to coach at all um, in that and I fail at that, but I try to let that be a, a more recreational um, 
um, session. And these are what I think are my, not my players, these players needs at the moment. And, you know, I've got some technical aspects there, some tactical aspects, social and, and, and psych. So things that I think my players really, it, it's relevant for them at the moment and at their stage of learning. So my question again to myself was, OK, well, if I'm going to use Rondos or Shevers, as, as uh, my, the players at Inner West Hawks call it, um, um, are they, are, is it going to help? Is it going to be relevant for them? So in answering this, this uh, question, I thought, well, OK, well, how can we keep the benefits of the Rondo, as Luis explained? But can we can they also maximise learning? And you can see I've put a question mark um, uh, after that, because I, 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 I don't know. I'm not sure. So I came up with this, really, that I think is, is appropriate for my context. OK, and it's I'm just going to. Give, just talk through this and then that will be me done really. I'll show a few examples. I think Luis says it originated as an arrival activity and, and myself and Dan were speaking this morning, even when we were you know, in England, we, we're pretty much sure we did this when we got the training. Um, so as an arrival activity, um, then um, I'm gonna show how we might introduce, we, introduce some challenges and then how we may turn it into a more um, focused um, activity. And again, I'm just repeating, that's why I've kept this picture there. Um, and not only because it's the only picture I've ever got where all the boys seem to be looking and paying attention, um, but just to remind that it's my, it's my context I'm talking about here. So the arrival activity, I think, is, is a really important thing, obviously, logistically. Um, it helps you um, set up. It gives kids something to do when, when they arrive rather than just, just waiting around. But the benefits for the players, they own the Rondo. You know, they invent their rules. I'm sure there are variations and there are lots of similarities, but they decide the rules. You know, they decide who's going in the middle. I don't know if your players do that, quickly drop down to one knee, but I, you know, hadn't seen that before. I've learned that off the players. Um, the social benefits, it's their chance to, to chat and, and talk. There is more often than not smiles and laughter, as you saw in that video. And the tricks, creativity, disguise and, and, and technical aspects. So that's what the players are getting out for it. As the coach, I think we can get something out of it beyond just the boys, or girls doing something while we're setting up. Um, it's a really good chance to observe. And what I'm looking for here is not the maybe the football aspects. It's more the, OK, how do they seem tonight? Do they seem that they're, they're lively? Do they seem that they're a bit quieter? Um, you know, how's the, um, how's the environment? Um, looking and then sometimes I, I will actually join in now I know there's lots of debates about joining in now I, I go on the outside I don't go on the inside and start diving into tackles but I might just go on the, the, the outside and my reason for that is so I can start to interact with my players okay I can start talking to them I can start contributing to to set in the environment that I think will will help the the, the, the session um, so it's good for their self-organisation and their independence, but also, you know, a chance for me then to interact with players and them to interact with themselves. And then the next stage for me is it, it's still, I don't want to take away from it being player-owned, and it's not to say that anything else in the session isn't player-owned, but I, as the coach, might start to manipulate it a little bit now. Okay, so I might begin to have more input, and um, this, this bit will only be a small part of, of the session, but I will start to maybe put in some rules and some challenges into the into the rondo. Um, so some examples. Um, it may be that I've, I've, I've the, and these are based on my players. Um, it may be I've, I've got a player that um, um, probably isn't prepared to to take risks or is quite predictable. So I might give that player. Um, a little challenge of, look, can you use some disguise? Can you fool those defenders? Can you trick those defenders? Um, it may be Dan is um, um, a very safe player, passes it off to the next person beside him all the time. So now I might say to Dan, hey, Dan, can you play one touch across the space? Or maybe that might be phrased as split the defenders. And I should say that sometimes these are given to everybody, or sometimes I might just um, assign them to, to, to one person. Um, it might be Luis is a player that gets rid of it quite quickly. 
um, you know, is, is quite reluctant to, to make a mistake. Um, so I might give him the challenge of, look, can you draw a defender close and then, then pass the ball um, off into, in, into space? And um, it may be for me that I'm particularly one footed um, and maybe rather than say, oh, look, I want to use both feet, that the, the challenge for one of my players at the moment, just, could, just can you receive it with your other foot? Because that sets you up on your stronger foot um, quicker and better. Um, so I might um, start to manipulate the rondos and add some of those challenges, which may be for everybody or maybe for individuals. And I have in the past written them out like a menu on a whiteboard and just got the, 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 the players to select their own one. Okay, and that's always quite nice to get the parents to guess what challenge they think the players are, are, are doing. And then we get to the, the bit that I think um, is challenged me. Um, well, okay, is there a chance for the Rondo to lead into um, um, the main focus of my session. And I showed you earlier what I think um, the team at the moment need to need to develop. So clearly I need to be doing that stuff in, in, in training. So I'm just going to give, and to use Luis's words, can it become more representative? Okay, so I'm just going to give three examples of that. This is not a session. These are three examples of this stage of a session. So in this um, activity here, um, we've got a kind of, I think, a, a yeah, 6v2 um, rondo activity. And um, it, it progresses as normal. If, if a defender um, got the ball, they swap with the outside player, as, as shown in Dan's um, um, session plan that he provided. But I have a slightly different rule here. Um, if a player... Um, has received the ball three times, four times, five times. You decide based on the ability of your players, let's say three. If a player receives the ball for the third time and they're the first player to receive the ball for the third time, their task is to turn and attack the goal behind them. So if we're looking at the, the player with the ball at the moment, let's say um, that player has received the ball uh, three times, they are now turning and attacking the goal to the left. So for me, it helps in put in some technical aspects for my players at the moment. Um, they're not particularly, they take a long time to turn. They're not particularly good at turning on the back foot um, and our finishing isn't uh, that great. So it enables um, the team to practice that in, in the Rondo session. I can progress it um, and, and I could have a defender chasing or not. So when that blue player turns and attacks on the 1v1 finish, I could have one of the whites leave the circle and defend if I wanted to. I could turn that into a 2v1. So if that player with the ball turns, the player next to him or her um, attacks as a 2v1. So now we've got some decision making as well. Do I shoot or do I probably slide it across the goal for my, my teammate to shoot? Or it might be the player behind. Maybe it's my midfielder particularly slow to support my strikers. So maybe it's the player in the bottom right who, who supports and tries to get ahead of the ball. So that's just, just one example of how I, I thought, okay, can a, can a Rondo structure um, support what my players um, need at this moment? Another example, um, we've got exactly what Dan had at the beginning, really a 4v2, albeit a circle rather than a, a, a rectangle. Um, so this is our, our, our usual setup and... Um, this is about my players getting a little bit more uh, switched on to transitions, reacting to transitions, whether that's attack to defence or defence to attack. And also, additionally, their ability to build up um, and play through the thirds, which we're, we're not great at. So this is how this one would work. Again, it's the, it's the usual setup, 4v2. But this time when the defenders get it, I suppose a criticism of a rondo is that the game stops and they just swap over. Um, but in this one, the, a white defender that um, gets the ball, their challenge is either to play it into one of the goals if you haven't got the players, or what I prefer to do here, play it into one of the four out players on the outside. This then creates a 6v4. Okay, and then the challenge for the whites is can we progress the ball through the third so it becomes more directional. Challenge for the blues regain the ball, 
Okay, make a pass between you and then we go back to this situation. We reset and go back to this situation. So again, a rondo is starting it. We're using the, the, the rondo, but we're progressing into something that for my players becomes a bit more tactical and probably I'm going to be more, more involved in observing and correcting and, and coaching and asking questions. And then the final one um is an 8v2 so ignore the fact that the players are in different colors for the moment we have got 8v2 round this rectangle they are trying to keep the ball away it's the, the the only difference now is when a defender uh gets the ball it initiates a game so let's say the blue player in the middle uh as, as luis called i think for being you know, if if, if uh, that blue player gets the ball it initiates a game we go into the small-sided game straight away. So we break out of that and we play a directional game. I normally play that until a goal is scored or until one minute is up and then we reset and do this again. So I can also go from a, a rondo to a small-sided game. So just to recap, maybe now you're looking at some of those boxes and I'm looking at some of those boxes and I'm thinking, okay, actually this rondo format structure uh, does could tick some of these um, additional boxes for me as well so that that makes me happier and then again for my players does it start to address some of those um, aspects that I feel at the moment um, the majority of my players need to develop and I've come to a conclusion that actually, if I use that format of arrival activity, challenges, focused activity, I may be able to keep the benefits and maximise the learning. Okay, Dan, that's it from me. Brilliant. Um, I guess the, the first question before we go any further is, Carlos, what did you think? Does that sort of show you... Uh, a, sort of some answers to, to what you initially thought yeah it shows great progression from, um, um, not just a warm big size but to um yeah moving it to the uh small sided game so actually i've got a quick question um can, can you get a little bit more information about how to evolve it to the small sided game is it just getting the ball or is it do you put some sort of competition in there or is it a point system it it, it, the, the final slide, Carlos. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Look, in, in that example, as soon as a defender intercepts, that initiates the game. Okay. Yeah. So that initiates the breakout. We're now into a, a 5v5, 6v6 game. Um, and, and I play that game until a goal is scored or until one minute has been played. And then we go back to, to that rondo, rondo. Now, you could, of course, say, well, it's the, the third time. That the defender intercepts but by that 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 stage of the session for me it's we've it may not be about the rondo so much anymore i'm just using the rondo as a, as a structure so okay. yeah you can manipulate it depending on if you want them doing more rondo then you'd probably and, and your players are intercepting on the second pass every time they're not getting the repetition of the rondo so you right. might say like the fifth time a defender intercepts that's our breakout yeah. And, and what's your thought? Because on all the examples, you've really got two in the middle. What's your thoughts on one or three to both you, Lewis, or Gareth? Um, yeah. Can that I, I, change it up and vary it depending on the school level or just on to vary it on the me, exercise? For me, Carlos, you've answered your question there, depending on on the, the, the skill level. And I think, I think you know, if, if defenders are getting the ball all of the time, ultimately, probably a rondo is mainly for the outside um, players mainly doesn't mean it can't we can't work with the players on the inside you know there's when you have twos you get some great examples of the communication of the covering defender you know press show left show right so you get some really good um, information to stay close together so you don't get split but most of the time it's probably for the outside players so if defenders are getting the ball every time you probably want to make it easier for the outside players and if that they're in there, the defenders aren't getting it at all, then you'd make you'd make it harder. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and there's questions over the size of the area, the shape of the area, um, the rules that you use. Um, and I think you've got such a toolbox um, that you could manipulate it however you like, Carlos. That's excellent. Is there any other questions from, from any of the other audience? 
Um, any, any opinions? Anyone tried any of those activities before as a variation? I have a, a question to any of you in terms of uh, 3v1 or 4v2. When they start using a lot of Rondo, it's not my DNA again, but I remember taking my coach license in Japan. And um, one of the exercises was 3v1. And the uh, reasons for that is for not just for the Bobinho, whoever's in the middle, but especially for the possession. And the three key aspects of learning out of that was about the body position, or in Japan they could, we used to say body shape, and the um, passing accuracy and the pace that you put in the ball. Is it familiar to any of you guys when you were learning in the old days? Uh, and in England, did they use that, uh, Gareth or Dan, or how does, is it familiar to you? Those? Yeah, it would be a, about um, uh, opening up your body, play on your on your back foot, or suck them in and play on your front foot. Yeah. I guess it would depend on the coach and what sort of they brought to the table. But um, yeah, there was definitely aspects of that that I remember doing as a player. Right, yeah. I thought that was quite useful. Obviously, just doing that, you lose the if you don't put the more the, what do we call the the progression into a more um, objective way of playing. Then there's no meaning. But for uh, it's not meaningful. But for it depends on the stage of learning. I thought it was quite a useful tool to use for, especially for the the beginners um, to have. But again, if it, the, the whole point for me is about progression, it's about being applied to the real game situation. And this is when you talk, you mentioned a lot about this idea of manipulating. And this is when we say manipulation of task constraints or the environment constraints in terms of theory that um, I would like to one day, if I have the opportunity, I will talk more in depth about that, but this is not the nature of this, this webinar here. Okay, that's uh, I think my cue to uh, to move on a little bit. Um, you should now be able to see my screen. I, I can so, comment on that, Dan. And if you want as well. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah the, the, the three aspects um, just to, that I always um, talk to my team about and boys and obviously um, playing foot myself is obviously deceiving by either moving the ball or the body or the passing. So I was bring it down to those three things. And if you can roll all those three into one, you know, then that's almost like manipulating the perfect rondo. So just to, I guess, to um, reiterate what you were saying, Louise. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So um, now my little take on uh, a rondo and how we could possibly um, adapt it. So start off with the session plan that was sent to, to everyone. Um, so the core skill we're looking at is striking the ball and, and passing uh, component. But the objective that I wanted my players to do specifically within this session is improve the players to pass forwards. The issue we have with a run day though is, are they playing forwards or are they just playing left and right? It's what is really the direction? Because if this red player does have the ball and manages to play to the opposite side, great, that's a forward pass. But then is it actually a forward pass? Because the next person is going to pass the ball backwards and it's going to be a forward pass for them. Um, and then arguably as well, um, possibly the biggest downside of a rondo is the possibility that the players on the outside just sort of are very stationary. Um, I always try and get whenever I've seen it or, or coached it, the, the red players here are in the middle and they're responsible for using the whole width of that line. But there's many occasions where they'll go stand on the cone in the corner and they don't move from the cone in the corner and they just become basically a glorified mannequin. And you go, well, that's unrealistic to a game. Like how half the, the game for them is moving into position to receive a ball as much as it is actually what you do with the ball once you've got it if not more, because you spend more time during the game without the ball than with the ball. Um, so how could we look at a way possibly with 
lower ability players that um, potentially don't train as often and might only train one night a week. So within that one session, how can we maximize them moving and getting some fitness benefits and the health benefits and the social benefits, but as well as keeping that ball in play as much as possible. My assumption with this, because I thought it'd be quite an even number to work with or neutral number to work with is 12 players. So we would have two activities of this, but actually that could be different depending on what the numbers you've got. My variation of this actually goes basically to a small sided game. So what I did is I threw all the players in together um, and Actually, for this session, probably 10 players is more ideal than having 12 players. But what I'm now looking at is adding a game that has a lot more direction, um, has a lot more natural transition of winning the ball, keeping the ball, win the ball back. Can you score? Can you defend um, across all players? Uh, but now you've got the opportunity where your red players can play left and right. They can play backwards but they've also got the significant overload. So in this game, I'm looking at the red players trying to score by getting the ball into that shaded red zone. Um, and I'm looking for the yellow team to score by getting the ball into the yellow zone. To start off with my session, it's probably just get the ball in there however you want, uh, but that can develop into, um, do you want them to run with the ball? Well. If the session is about forward passing, potentially my progression, my rule later on can become, it must be passed into that end zone. Maybe it has to be a, only a blue player can receive it in the end zone. Maybe only a red or a yellow can receive it in that end zone. Whatever sort of combinations you're looking to, um, to create within that. Then we're having three teams of four, essentially. We can just rotate who becomes those those neutral players uh, and get everyone some fair and reasonable time at sort of playing in, in all three teams and having the dual roles. As my session would progress, then hopefully they are getting better at playing those forwards passes. And then I'm able to possibly take away two blue players, make one a red, one a yellow, and it becomes 5v5 five five plus two blue players. And then to finish my session with my game, I would then take that to then just 6v6 and play almost the same game. I might have a goal rather than the end zone. And there's a really, um, really clear transition between my training part where I'm going to be teaching them and then the last part where we're playing a game. What I would be looking from a coaching point of view now is, uh, can, I, can I talk about body shape? Well, um, when this red player has the ball, uh, can we talk about positions to receive the ball can you be between the lines can you be outside of your defender don't get man marked uh, blue players can you as you're neutral you don't have to defend can you always be in a position where you can receive a ball be it high be it wide be it deep whatever works uh, in that position always be an option we can talk about the technique that we can pass with be it laces inside of the foot left foot right foot whatever combination we want to come up with dependent on the age and the stage of the players that we're, we're dealing with. Um, and, and then how do we relate that to the game? Um, had conversations before about one possible weakness of training sessions is that we don't relate it enough to the game for our players. So they might have a really good first touch. They might be able to bring the ball down, but then what actually happens when there is a defender that's closing you down? What happens if we have a goal that we're trying to defend or a goal that we're trying to score? How can we make the right decision to use the right or, or the most suitable technique in order to achieve that outcome? A rondo sometimes can be a little bit too vague, a little bit too generic. You're always receiving pressure from a defender from a forward position, never from behind, rarely from the sides. <laughs> if someone's gone charging out and coming back in, um, you're often receiving the same sort of passes. Um, you, you're not really transferring a, a significant distance of passing. Um, and the other thing that probably gets me a little bit particular when I'm delivering coaching courses is if you make 10 passes, that's a goal. 
Well, the reality is on the weekend, you probably will never play 10 passes and score a goal at the end of that. Uh, you, or you might get one in a season, depending on the team you work with. A lot of goals will actually come from you've won the ball, you've played one or two passes, you've counter-attacked quickly, and then you've scored, which a rondo is tough, not impossible, but is tough to replicate that side of things. Whereas a small-sided game like this, you might be able to have that all the time. And if, for example, the yellow player here that's closest to the ball, if he or she can win the ball and pass the ball to that blue player straight away, that's an a success in my session straight away because I want them to to make forward passes. So they've been able to win the ball through high pressure and make a forward pass and score straight away. Whereas in a typical rondo, that yellow player as the defender would win the ball and then now become, let's stop the game and I go on the outside. Or there might be a rule you have to win the ball as a spinner and pass it to your teammate. Well, that's probably then a sideways pass. Um, and then how we can look at... Um, expanding that then into a game and for I think for a lot of coaches that are potentially new to coaching playing it in a game like this is a can be a little bit less of a strain on the coach particularly if you are new or you have a low knowledge base or low self-confidence in what to do because if you're not too sure you don't have to manage too much. You don't. You might have to manage how many balls you've got on the sideline. You might have to manage how long those blue players stay as blue players and can they rotate into the other ones. But if you're not too sure what to coach, the players are probably going to be happy because they're playing a game. It's it's 4v4, playing a game, scoring a goal. Maybe you just add a net at the end and then you're, um, you're there and you, you haven't had have to do too much. The chances are they've been running around the whole time and they've been getting lots and lots of touches on the ball. They've probably been playing it at a match intensity because a defender's coming to win the ball, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that, that is me on my variation. Someone has asked a question. Uh, no, I just finished it. All right, so uh, I guess open to the floor, any, any thoughts, opinions on uh, either what you've just seen from, from my variation or from, from anything you've heard from any of the others? Dan, can I, it, it just, it's not, it's not a question at all. It's just a comment and maybe I'd love it if it, if it sparks people to, to share one of the, what, what your session reminded me of, of saying I'd forgotten about one of my favorite tweaks of a rondo is actually putting an attacker in the middle as well. You know, whether it's a, um, a one V two then in the middle or two attackers to make a two V two. I think that then challenges um, players to look forward um, in that in that circle um, or rectangle to try to find somebody, um, I find that becomes a lot more realistic when 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 you do that and just your setup, um, you know, thinking of what the blue players are doing when they're on the side reminded me of that. So um, I just thought I'd mention that. But I would I would I would also love to know if if just let less you know if anyone's got any little rules or little tweaks that they have for the rondo and, and what that is and why they use it but um, I, I i would I, i've got a pen ready i'd love to write them down i can talk if no one else has got anything to say <laughs> yes you go Carlos. <laughs> um yeah I, I guess going back to, to dan's first ex, uh First, um, well, the session plan you just showed, but the first template. I like to do two rondos side by side, and uh, just reiterating what Dan was saying. Obviously, you know, we're only doing forward passes, and and obviously the defender's always in front of you. But you're doing two by two side by side. Um, randomly, I actually um, uh, blow a whistle, so that the, the the two in the middle or one in the middle have to swap. So then, the, so then the people on the outside of the rondo will then have to look at the different areas of space, not just in front of them from attackers coming forward. But the key to that is that the ball needs to be keep moving on the outside as well. I think that's a, a great variation, especially for the young ones. And also, um, obviously, communication, really important in the SAP program too. So having one in the middle, I find, is, is really good. 
Um, but as soon as you know they get to that sixth or seventh pass and they haven't got any help yet, they're you know, calling out for help using one of their players' names that's in the run to come out and help them. Um, I find really beneficial too, just to build that communication as well. So there's all those little different variations you can add. Um, yeah, just, I, like, yeah. I like that, Carlos. So they, so the person in the middle, if they feel that they're struggling, that it's their ownership to, it's their, it's their responsibility to call a probably a mate's name to come in and help them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I like that. That's really and, good. And um, Gareth, I'm like you. I do play on the outside with them, but occasionally I get caught, and um, I just don't think it's the right thing to say. Well, I can't go in the middle because I'm uh, the coach. That's exactly I, what I do. It's never my fault, Carl. Yeah. It's, if, if I've if I've given the ball away, it's the it's the receiver that didn't move that's into space. You know, yeah. never never me. Fair. Well, then I get in the middle, but it doesn't take me long to call for help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a couple of variations for you as well. Something else I'll mention as well as a variation that I've done in the past is um, after uh, so many passes, rather than be 10 and you've got a goal or 10 and the defender stays in, is it after 10 or is it five? Can you swap the balls over across the two areas um, and normally it falls to pieces at the same scenario? The, the other one that I've tried, which is... Yeah, really sorry. Uh, one, one of the reasons that's good as well is they're constantly scanning, aren't they? They're constantly looking at the other, 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 other area. So, yeah, I love that one as well. The, um, and then the other one that I, I've seen that is really tough to pull off, so I would only suggest doing it if you've got a group that needs a challenge, is you have a second ball, but... So your normal ball is playing, passing around, trying to get through the area, and then your second ball has to go, be it clockwise or anti-clockwise, within your circle. So they are should always be scanning to their left or right because they're going to have that second ball come. And all that does is that one can't get tackled. Um, so the two defenders in the middle are only still looking at that one that's pinballing around. This second ball is just to try and keep those outside players looking at something else and just go touch pass touch pass touch pass all the way around just hot potato it to the next person um and do you do that with ball in hand as well dan or is it just always ball at feet i've always done it with ball in feet but actually ball in hand probably would be a good step down to make that a little bit easier um but yeah i'd, I'd actually never thought of that one but that's uh, yeah that's a great idea I have um, also Dan, been thinking it. Oh, let's keep going, Lewis. Keep going. Lewis. Yeah, no, it's very interesting um, to see already uh, some of the different perspective, and this is what enriches so much uh, this type of conversation because um, this idea of direct play, as you explain, uh, then it's very important and passing forward. But I like also the, the philosophy, the culture aspect of, uh, of the saying of the Chinese, before you go forward, you need to go back. So, um, so what is the problem with passing the ball back? Sometimes I've seen parents, especially criticizing a player, why you don't kick the ball in front or... Um, so it's all, it all depends on the context. I think if the opportunity or the for actions or the decision making of that particular player, if it is the opportunity to pass the ball forward, you go forward. But if not, then you need to pass the ball back or do something else. So this is some of the aspects probably we don't have much time to um, explain or to discuss the whole aspect of it today. But there's a lot of um, interesting points of, out of that. Another thing, um, thing that you mentioned then is like, well, it's so clinical sometimes in general, and I agree that Rondo became this idea of a body shape, passing the ball, ball possession. But how, what happened when you don't have any of those opportunities? What are you going to do as a, as a player? And as a coach, what are you going to say to your players? You can't pass the ball in front. You can't pass the ball back. You, and one of the limitations of Rondo, then you just have one or two taps. So can you stimulate the creativity out of that then? And if it's so, for example, flick the ball or looking for different options. But then if the coach imposed that you needed to pass the ball just back and forth or so on, then don't give the freedom to the players to create. And this is when it goes back to my first point when in my presentations, my assumptions is 
there's a lot of evidence that if you manipulate the constraints, task constraints, you are going to improve learning and, and enhance performance. But as a scientist of sports, I'm interested in how to actually train in a way, stimulate players to uh, improve the creativity and improvisation, maybe within Rondo aspect or any other form of the training. I think that's the, the, the it's, a, it's a rich uh, um, concept or idea that I'm trying always keeping what is the next step apart from being so efficient like the Germans and, and so on, but how about the creativity? How do you train that? Um, within that, I would like to ask an open question, a, a very basic question to everybody that I would like to understand. What is the main aim of using Rondo as a tool for your training? In other words, is it for training technique or is it to train what we call perception, game awareness? And if so, how do you do that? Like, that's the challenge, I think. Does anybody would like to comment on that? I'm, I'm ready, if not, Luis. I, I had the same thing written down. I had know why you're doing it, you know, and uh, I'm happy if the reason is just that social smiles, interactions, then great. I, I, I would be happy. For, for people to say that's why I'm using it. it it's it's for the social um, aspects. It's that arrival activity. Um, equally, I'm happy for someone to say I'm I'm doing it because it improves technique um, and, and creativity. But I think you're right. It's it's knowing why you're using it and and also what you're not getting out of it. Okay, you know, I, there's not a practice or a game necessarily that gives us everything, is there? So um, I, I had exactly the same. Um, Thing written down what what are you getting from it and what aren't you getting from it um and that was the question i asked myself in the presentation i know some things i'm getting by the design of it but maybe i can squeeze that sponge a little bit more and get some other stuff out of it um as well i haven't answered your question i was just saying no, I, no, have yeah, same, no, I, I have the same question yeah i have <laughs> I'm in the similar line of focus here and ideas yeah I think, um, Louis, in terms of your question, you could probably tick all those boxes, right? That it depends on exactly what you want to achieve with that. Uh, I would personally use a Rondo a lot more for the social side of things and the, the warm up. And I don't like them turn up to train and just smashing balls at goal before they've warmed up or whatever. I want them <laughs> actually to do something that's a bit more beneficial. Um, but I'm not going to use it as much in my training sessions because I would prefer to play more of a natural small sided game through personal preference, but you can get some really good first touch and passing development in something like that. And I've also mm. delivered sessions where the Rondo at the beginning of the session was so good. We kind of just kept on going and going and going and going <laughs> and didn't want to, we didn't want to stop because it was so enjoyable. Um, so I, I guess that's the, one of the benefits is you being the coach, right? You can make decisions that suits yes. what you think is yeah. your players, what your team needs. Um, is it a Monday training session after a Sunday game where you want it to be a little bit lighter? Um, is it a Friday session before a Saturday game and again you want it to be a little bit lighter? Or is it one where you want it to be hard work and you're going to make it bigger and you're going to make that defender chase? Um, it's, it's very variable, right? And of course, skilled coaches will take it to represent um, positional um, aspects and formation aspects as well. Um, and again, that's obviously who you're coaching um, and, and, and your knowledge. But, you know, I, I've seen some coaches um, really make it uh, reflect their game that they're going to be playing or even their opponent's game. So, yeah, I think it's um, I think I think the word Rondo can mean different things which is maybe part of the issue but i'd like to go back to the, the the point we made at the beginning dan that you know hopefully people can see that anything that you you uh, steal from the internet or, or or a book or whatever it's 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 that process of of going through well how can i change this to for my players needs but also how can i change this so it it is more um, uh, realistic and representative of of the game that they play. 
Yeah, Please, I'm, uh, well, I, oh, sorry. No, you go. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. Um, I think uh, what you mentioned then in terms of progressing from Rondo to, to a small side of the game and be more objective in terms of what you want to achieve, uh, similar to the game. I think there's some Rondo or some small sided games that could be considered Rondo as well. The whole point for me, I, I think out of this, apart from the, the, the skills, the, the technique, it's the perception, action, motor skills. It's not just the, the, the motor skills, but the, the cognitive part of it, that uh, rondo. But if you progress towards the small-sided game, as you mentioned, then I think this is the key to develop a lot of players and a lot of uh, um, um, under or developing, emergent developing countries in terms of football. They are very skillful the ball on the feet, but it's not really coupled yet or linked with the perception, the game awareness. And I think um, when the players and the team in general have this coupling is really attuned between perception and action, then this is when it became a powerhouse in this, like England or, or France or any other countries. And I think uh, with the Rondo with some form of variations and progressions and progressing to the small side of the game, you give the opportunity to the players to develop that without saying too much explicitly what to do, but they, then you, you do the player-led or the discovery learning type of training and um, an effective way of learning to develop this idea of perception action couple that we would love one day to um, explain the the mechanism out of it in terms of the theories, but I don't want to be too boring here talking about theories, but there's a lot of mechanism behind it anyway. Well, uh, we are now just looking at the time, 10 past eight, we've uh, we've been going for, for just over an hour, which uh, we sort of said we'd aim to be about an hour. So I think that's a good point to, to sort of finish on um, what I'm just going to do very quickly, just make everyone aware that uh, we actually have our second um, coach education piece happening on Thursday this week. We have uh, an injury prevention session, which will be delivered by uh, Will Thom, who is a physiotherapist for Football Australia with the national team. So he's actually just got back into the country very recently um, after being away with the Joeys. Um, so this will actually be a face-to-face -face session, not an online session. And part of that is because we actually want to, to do a couple of the injury prevention activities um, and get you to not get a sweat on, but just be able to get some good technique as well, rather than just seeing it on a picture um, and go from there. Other than that, um, thank you very much for participating in our session today. It's been really insightful for myself and um, seen some things and, and heard of some things in a, a very common practice that I, I possibly haven't thought of before. So some, some really good variations and hopefully, um, we have uh, learned something as coaches for tonight. So big thank you to Gareth, to Luis, and uh, obviously ACPE for, for jumping on um, and supporting Hills Football and the, the local coaches in their development.